Hey, Nick. Welcome to the show. Shannon, I am excited to be here. You are my people. So we can nerd <laughs> out about some books today and some business stuff. Absolutely. You're my people too. I'm so excited to talk to you. Could you just briefly introduce yourself to everyone listening and let them know what you do? Sure. So my name is Nick Hutchison. I'm from the Boston, Massachusetts area. I started a company called Book Thinkers back in 2017. At that time, it was a side hustle. It's grown to a full-time position. I have 10 people on my team. We serve hundreds of authors a year by helping them promote and market their books. I also host a podcast where I've interviewed so many of my favorite authors doing a deep dive on their books. In my very first book, Rise of the Reader, Strategies for Mastering Your Reading Habits and Applying What You Learn, is launching November 1st, so yesterday when this is out. And uh, yeah, yeah, I just love helping people get more from the books they're reading. Love it. Who are some of the author- authors that you've interviewed, just so we can drop some names? Yeah, people like Grant Cardone, Alex Hormozzi, Patrick Bed david Ryan Holiday, Robert Greene, Vanessa Van Edwards. So that's those are just six of the 150 episodes that we've had, but so many of my favorite people. And remind us, what's the name of the podcast again? It's called Book Thinkers, Life-Changing Books. Love it. We're going to dive into you know, life-changing books, but how to make books life-changing, which I think is a, there's a step in the process that people tend to overlook, which is actually implementing the stuff they learn, right? We're going to talk about that today. What are some of your tips, Nick, on taking us from that kind of consumption and that high off of like, oh my God, I got a new book. I love it. I mean, we read Hormozy all the time. I just finished Hormozy's book twice. And you know, how do we turn that into actual results for ourselves as entrepreneurs? Sure. Well, I have so many tips and I know we'll dive into a bunch of them. We can use uh, $100 million leads, which just launched as an example. So Perfect. sometimes I'll meet people and I'll say, hey, what are you reading? And they'll tell me and I'll say, why? And I'm sort of met with a blank stare. Like, what do you mean, why? Well, why are you reading the books you're reading? I think it's important to set a goal or a smart intention for each book that we read. So $100 million leads, two different people. One just decides to read the book and hopes that it'll change their life and their lead generation will go through the roof. The other says, I'd like to set a goal for this book that follows the SMART goal framework. So it's specific, it's measurable, it's attainable, meaning realistic, it's relevant to their life or business, so it's emotionally connected to what they're doing, and it's time-bound. So when I read $100 million leads, or I'm actually not fully through the book yet, but when I started the book, I set an intention that sounded something like this. I don't have the book in front of me, but Find and implement at least two lead generation strategies for book thinkers by the end of September. So now I have a specific goal. It's measurable. Find and implement two things. I know whether or not the book has achieved its goal for me. That's an attainable goal. I didn't say make $100 million from leads by the end of the month. Just find and implement two things. It's relevant to my business. I have a growing business, but we kind of stink at lead gen. And I know that Alex Hormozzi is very good at it, so he can help my business. And I'm emotionally connected to making that happen. And I gave myself a deadline. It's time bound. I said by the end of September. So it forces me to take a little bit of action. Now, on top of that, I love to write my intention for each book on the inside cover so that as I dive in to read the book, I review the intention first and my brain starts to filter for those two things to find and implement. I'm not reading aimlessly without intention. I'm reading with a very specific goal in mind. And I think that's a precursor for taking better action. I know that was a lot of info. Did that kind of track well? Oh, totally. I think that what most people miss, and tell me if you agree, most people miss is that step. They go in page one to page two to page three and let it guide them almost reactively versus setting that proactive intention. I think that's so powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And there is some benefit to reading in a reactive state. I mean, I've found so many things reading that way, but I find more things useful and I take better action when I am a little bit more intentional. Definitely. I'm going to I'm gonna share something too, because we are recording this as I just got back from Arizona from a couple of different events. I was at uh, Lori Harder's Girlfriends in Business and Chris Harder's Mastermind Roundtable. And we walked home. I'm not kidding. I walked home with six new books. Because there were either authors launching at these events, there were people who were giving them away, people were sharing them left and right. It's like the new Halloween candy for entrepreneurs. You come home with six new books from every conference from all these different authors. 
I am so excited to dive into them, but I am overwhelmed and I know what's going to happen. They're going to sit on my desk. They're going to sit on a shelf and they're not going to get opened because I won't know where to start. What is your advice for me in that situation? That's a that's a great situation to have. Lots of books, lots of amazing people, and you're energized to read them. I really do think that slow and steady wins this race. I think that no matter how many times you read Aesop's fable, the tortoise and the hare, the tortoise always wins. And so for me, slow, consistent action always beats like these, you know, spikes of excitement followed by I'm overwhelmed and now I'm not going to take any action, sort of that analysis to paralysis situation. Yeah. And even at events, I mean, I'll walk home with notebooks full of information, but if I'm not intentional about what I'm looking to learn, that notebook just kind of, you know, it ends up sitting on the shelf and it doesn't get put to use. So yeah, I would I would look at the six books that you have and I would say, do any of these books solve a problem that I'm facing on a daily or weekly basis? And can they help me overcome that? Or do any of these books promise to help me develop a specific skill that I know I'm missing or that I know I could learn a little bit more from? And if the answer is no, then they probably won't serve you as much as you're hoping. You know, you might not be the target reader for these books, even though they're exciting. You just met the author. And so I do have in my book, Rise of the Reader, a list, kind of like a personal inventory, questions that you can ask yourself about your next read to determine if it's going to be a good fit for you. And those are a few examples. Uh, I read books all the time that I don't have a specific intention for while I'm starting. And I develop that intention as I get to know the material a little bit better. And some of those books have changed my life more than others. So, you know, still dive in and read them, but maybe not all in the same week, maybe kind of slow and steady. Yeah, that's a great point. And I've also been back and forth, but I have this kind of I mean, I'm an Enneagram three for anyone who follows it. And I love to get them. I love to get things done. I love to finish books that I start. And I like to do it fast. So to your point, taking that advice. But also, I I realize that there's a lot of books that I get through the material. I want to set an intention. And then I realize, you know what? This I this isn't really serving me right now. Or this mm-hmm. isn't really related to a current problem I have. And I want to just end it early. But I feel this guilt about not finishing the book. Do you ever come across that with folks that you're helping or have any advice for folks who seem to can't or seem to not be able to finish something or feel like some type of guilt over not doing it? Yeah, for the first, I mean, seriously, couple of hundred, for the first couple of hundred books that I read, I felt the same way. I'd read every word of every page. And if I didn't, then it didn't count as a book that was read. And that's what I was optimizing for at the time. I set goals around consumption, not about implementation or action. Mm. Nowadays, if I find what I need in the first couple of chapters of a book, I'll put it down. And my advice for people is to optimize not for the number of books that you read, but for the actions that you take. And sometimes you can find those in the first few chapters. I was listening to a pod, so a different perspective. I was listening to a podcast where I think Tim Ferriss was interviewing Ryan Holiday or vice versa. They were just having fun with each other. And Ryan shared the rule of 100. So he says, take the number 100 and subtract your age. For me, I'm 29. That means 71. I have to read at least 71 pages before I can put the book down and determine whether or not it's a good fit for me. The older you get, the less you have to read because the wiser you have become is the philosophy. And so I say that's a good rule. You know, if people are looking for a very strict set of principles uh, to follow, maybe read your age subtracted from a hundred that many pages. I love and, I've, never, uh, I've never heard that before. I love that idea. You know, I'm just like you, right? With the guilt a little bit. I mean, can you say you've read it? Does that even matter if you've said you've read it? You know? And and I no, I don't think that we should feel guilty. Sometimes we do feel like three feet from gold, like maybe on the next page is that thing that I need. But if the author doesn't vibe with you, if you're not getting what you what you set out to get from the book, if it doesn't meet your intention, I'd say put the book down. Life is too short to read bad books. I agree. And it it just makes you feel like a quitter though. I think that's the the feeling is like, yeah. I don't want to be a quitter on this, but and maybe it will get better, right? We don't want to even want to give up TV shows that we don't even like. We're going, go, maybe it will get better. It's like, just let it go. Find something else. But going back to taking action and you started with the question, you know, why? 
Why are you reading it? So I want to flip it back to you and say, Nick, why are you so passionate about reading, about what you're doing with book thinkers and about helping authors? Yeah, when I was in my late teens, early 20s, it was a very confusing time for me, like I'm sure it is for a lot of people. I mean, on one side of the spectrum, I had developed an ego. It was very competitive. I played a lot of sports. And so I think my ego had a lot to do with my competitive nature, and it would represent itself at the expense of the people I was around. And so it wasn't a lot of fun to be around. And on the other side of the spectrum, I had a lot of insecurities, especially around my ability to communicate what people thought of me. I just analyzed other people's thoughts way too much. And so as I fell into this world of personal development, I started to remove my ego. I started to remove a lot of insecurities, and I developed a much more fulfilling life. Now, that's not as big of a transformation as you'll hear sometimes. It it wasn't a ton of trauma into like this beautiful place, but everybody's pain is relative. And, you know, I experienced a lot of pain as a result of the place that I was in, and I overcame that pain with books. And so I've heard it said this way, your purpose comes from your pain. I do believe that the right book at the right time can change somebody's life. It's happened in my life over and over and over. I've removed pain after pain after pain. And I've developed skill after skill after skill. And as a result, I enjoy the passage of time. Like I live a good life. Life doesn't have to be as hard as everybody makes it out to be. So that's why I'm connected to this purpose. In my community, we have about 150,000 nonfiction book lovers on Instagram and another 50,000 on some of our other platforms. I've heard thousands of testimonials about how these books can help change somebody's life. I've seen the tangible results. And so, yeah, I'm just, I'm connected to a purpose. I'm connected to a mission. So everything that I do is connected to that why, that the right book at the right time can change somebody's life. Trying to serve my younger self, like, hey, wake up. Life doesn't have to be so hard. You can read and implement these books and things get better. So that's why. Totally. And, you know, a big part of it, like you said, is implementing and taking action. That's how they can change lives. They don't just change lives on the page with inspiration, they can, but with the inspiration, if it doesn't provoke action, it's basically idea sharing. And and I wanted to ask you from an author's perspective, how could an author of a nonfiction book or an aspiring author do a better job at promoting that action and making the book something that is easy to take action on? You know, the number one piece of feedback that I've received, positive feedback that I've received so far from early readers of my book, Rise of the Reader, is that it is punchy and actionable. And that's what I've tried to do. I want to help people make the action piece as crystal clear as I can. And it took a lot of work and simplification and the dumbing down. I mean, Hormozy writes at a third to fifth grade reading level. I didn't quite get there, but I tried really hard. You know, it's that idea that with more time, you can actually simplify things. And so when an author is writing a book, I try to encourage them to be as actionable as possible, to lay out the steps, to define the frameworks that people should implement and try to create some accountability there as well. You know, so in my book, I was very cognizant of that. There are plenty of books that I've read that are actionable and plenty of them that I've read that are not actionable. And so I think I started to understand the difference a little bit. And yeah, I I just... You know, the best written books are not always the best selling books. I think the best selling books are the ones that are promoted and marketed a lot, but they're also the ones that catch that word of mouth viral potential and or viral momentum. And that's because they encourage that person to take action. Other people notice that change in behavior. They ask about it and the book gets recommended. And so I tried to bake a lot of that into my book as well. For example, Sometimes people quote Marcus Aurelius when they're talking about stoicism. I get it. I love Marcus Aurelius. I mean, I want to name one of my future kids Marcus Aurelius, but Marcus Aurelius can't help promote my book. Ryan Holiday, who writes on a similar subject, can. And so why ever quote Marcus Aurelius when you can quote Ryan Holiday? That's how to get a book out there because the likelihood that he's going to promote it is more than Marcus is going to promote it, right? And so there's all these little things that I've baked in there that I think all together will hopefully create a little bit more word of mouth momentum. Yeah. And I think that's a great transition into talking about marketing books, which I know is a huge passion of yours too, and how we can get the word out better. I know you just said that 
and you and you're spot on. Word of mouth is key because whenever if you're reading a good book and you can't put it down, you also can't stop talking about it. Yes. And if somebody else is looking for a recommendation for a book, I, I couldn't tell you how many times a friend will go on vacation to the beach and say, hey, what is everybody reading right now? Like, what should I be reading on the beach? They're not really Googling because I feel like there's this, this overwhelm of information and this massive endless library that we can choose from that we just kind of turn to our friend and say, what are you reading right now? It's just easier. Even strangers on Facebook will say, what are you reading right now? And take recommendations. So I 100% agree with you that it has to be shareable with almost anything you do in business it should be shareable, especially something like this. Yes. Well, my my obsession with, I would say it is an obsession with promoting and marketing books started when I first built this book thinkers community. So I was sharing the books that I was reading on social media and as that community started to grow, I'm posting book reviews. Authors are sharing those book reviews. More authors would say, hey, I wanted my, I want my book featured. And so the first successful form of monetization came when authors would knock at my door in my DMs on Instagram and say, hey, how much do you charge for a book review? And I was like, ooh, charge for a book review. That's interesting. I'm reading for free right now. And now I can get paid to read. That's awesome. I was working a full-time sales and marketing job at the time. And so I started to do these paid book reviews and I would, you know, I'm reading business books. I learned how to upsell and follow up with people. Hey, is there anything else that I could help with? Like, I want to work in this space full time one day. Can I try out something related to social media or podcasting or whatever? And I tried a lot of things related to book marketing that didn't work. And I found a few that did work really well. On top of that, I got to know my target client a lot better. I got to understand their pain. What are they dealing with? And if you put yourself in the shoes of a lot of these authors, they spend decades understanding something really well. And then they spend years writing about that subject so that other people can learn from it. And then nobody buys their book. Like how upsetting is that? They know they want to be of service to the right person, but they just can't get the book in front of them. And so book thinkers, my business can step in and help with that. Like I mentioned today, we have about 10 people on our team. We serve hundreds of authors a year. And although there are a bunch of things that we do, most of our revenue comes from three things. So number one, we still do book reviews. We have an audience of hundreds of, well, thousands, you know, 150,000 nonfiction book lovers that are always looking for new books. And so we can get the book in front of a lot of potential target readers. Number two, podcast booking. So we can place authors on up to 100 shows to talk about their book in anticipation of launch. And then number three, and this is the biggest growing area of my business, which is short form video production. So helping an author turn a physical paper book into 50 to 100 pieces of short form video content for Instagram, TikTok, YouTube shorts, things like that. And my target client for that leverages their book as a business card. So they don't make money from selling the book. They'll sell a ton of books. It's not really where they make their money. If the book connects back to a higher ticket complimentary product or service like coaching, consulting, speaking, or some other type of business. And we can kind of build that funnel with them for them, generate a bunch of additional attention for the book, which results in additional business outside of the book. That's kind of the best situation for us. Yeah, that makes total sense. And do you recommend, I mean, for authors, aspiring authors that, you know, it's kind of like when to write a book is always a big question is like, when does it make sense for me to write a book? And better yet, the question is really, when does it make sense for me to promote a book? <laughs> because I feel like that is the, the, the biggest lift from the authors that I've talked to. They're saying, yeah, you're promoting a, your job is to promote a book, but you have to write it first. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the promotion is a big chunk of that work. I think people underestimate how much work goes into it. I know I did, even though I was working in the book space, <laughs> I thought that I could just sit down with my disciplined routine and write 500 words a day and it would be done in a few months. And that just, it didn't happen like that. It took me three years. So wow. I have a lot of respect for, for every author out there working to get their message out there. I think everybody who has something of value to offer their younger self you know, or to offer the world should write a book. Number one, it's a cathartic experience. Even if nobody buys it, you'll learn a lot about yourself and you'll help to define what you're trying to teach, which I think is very important. I had some 
imposter syndrome around the process for myself. I mean, I'm 29 years old. When I started the process, I was 26. I mean, was I too young? Did I have enough to share? Do I have to make bazillions of dollars first? And what I realized and what I heard from some friends was that if if you do have something of value to share with the world that's unique and different from anything else that's out there, if you can serve somebody who's one or two steps behind you in the process, then yeah, I write your book. You know, so when I first started my reading journey, 20, 21 years old, like, am I doing things differently now, today? Of course I am. Everything's different. So I have something to share for that young, motivated professional who knows there's a gap between where they are and where they want to be. They just don't know what steps to take. I can help that person. And so I decided to write the book. And then as far as book marketing, yeah, a lot of people think they'll put a book out there and it will sell. I mean, there are over a million books released every year. And Amazon KDP makes it very easy for people to self-publish and print on demand. So it's really inexpensive. So yeah, there's a lot of books out there. You're competing with a lot of other people. And so you have to generate attention. And if you choose not to generate attention, you're choosing not to sell your book. Very true. But to your point, I think that if you're, you know, if you're writing to sell books and have that be your main income stream, that is super challenging. It's really designed to be kind of like your business card, I think, today. And I couldn't agree more. But I want to talk about your book for a second and what you go through in that book, because it's for the rise of the reader. And this is specifically for readers, right, to be able to read better, if you will. Could you just speak to that in terms of who it's for, what they're going to get out of it, and maybe shed some light on some of the frameworks that you teach in there? Yeah, it's for people who have just started their reading process. They're consuming personal development material, but they don't feel like they're implementing enough. They don't feel like they're retaining enough. You know, if somebody says, hey, if you read XYZ book and you're not sure, then this book is for you. And so over the years of building my community, hundreds, maybe thousands of people reached out over the years saying some form of Hey, Nick, I appreciate all of the book recommendations, but I feel like I'm not taking great notes. What's your process? Or I feel like I'm not retaining enough. What's your process? Or I feel like I get excited to take action, but I don't know what to do next. What's your process? And so I had to stop. You know, I was answering people, but like I feel like I was underserving them a little bit. And so I had to stop and first observe my own behavior from a third party perspective. Like, what the heck was Nick Hutchison doing to take these books and implement them effectively? And that was a tough process. Like I mentioned, it took me about three years of observing my own behavior and trying to articulate what was happening and defining that process for people. And so I gave one example already, which is setting an intention for each book that you read and then taking educated action. You know, I think, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but on the tail end of the $100 million leads example, like not every action is created equally. And so when you finish reading a book and you look at, maybe these 10 to 15 potential actions that you could take, what 20% of those might lead to 80% of the change, you know, so narrowing it down and taking realistic action, I think is really important. I talk a lot about scheduling reading time in your calendar. So sometimes I'll meet people and they'll tell me, Hey, Nick, I'm not much of a reader, you know, and first I'll say, if I paid you $10,000 to read a book by the end of the month, you think that, you know, that you could do it. And they're like, I could read five. So if you value these books and you can insert them into your calendar, 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening, five days a week, you using that formula, even if you're just starting out and you kind of read slow, that's about 26 books a year. And slow and steady, it wins that race all the time. So I talk about scheduling reading time, effective reading strategies, effective note-taking strategies, how to store and organize your notes, and how to take action. And so do you want me to give uh, an action example for everybody? Yeah, absolutely. One of my favorite things to do is read with a group of people. And so if we are the average of the five people that we spend the most time with, why not read with the people that you spend the most time with and kind of rise together instead of shoot off by yourself, only to end up being dragged back down by the people around you who aren't investing in themselves. So in my book, I detail how to build an accountability group with your friends how to invite them so it doesn't seem super strange if that's not the vibe of the people that you spend a lot of time with, but also how to structure your weekly accountability meetings, how to read together, how to encourage each other, how to celebrate small wins, 
how to constructively criticize in an effective way and ask good questions and all sorts of stuff. And I think that the accountability groups that I built with my friends, you know, I'm showing up, I'm telling them about the book, what my favorite takeaways were. They're encouraging me to take action. They're holding me accountable if I slip. All of that kind of stuff has just created so much momentum and success in my life. And I really want to encourage other people to do the same. Love it. And so there's there's multiple benefits to this, right? There's the accountability for yourself for reading it, but also this relationship builder. So now there's another dimension of benefits. And I think that's what you're getting at here is that it doesn't have to just be in isolation or one dimensional, that you can take on these habits and have it actually transform not only what you know, but you know who you're interacting with and how it affects your day-to-day life. And that's a really good point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, if we are the average of the five people that we spend the most time with, you want to improve that average. You're reading these books for yourself. You're reading these books to be a better version of yourself for them, you know, and they should be doing the same thing. And uh, sometimes I hear, well, my friends aren't really into personal development, or that would be an awkward transition from just gossiping all the time or watching football to like talking about personal development type material. And I think there are interesting ways to kind of bring people into your world. For instance, let's say a friend of yours said they wanted to run a marathon a couple of years ago, but never did it. You call them up. Hey, remember how you said you were going to run that marathon? Can I hold you accountable to that? Do you want to start training again? Or remember that book, Rise of the Reader, that I gifted you last month? Like, have you started it yet? If not, do you want to read it together? Maybe we could meet on a monthly basis or weekly basis and chat about our favorite takeaways, and just slowly but surely build your friend group into that type of constructive, positive environment that you need. And you know, far too many people aren't doing that, and they just kind of tolerate mediocrity. And I think that that does a disservice to you, you know, to hang around with people that don't want to build themselves. Well, I think it is too, that we allow the influence of others and their priorities, right? So if it's you know, like you said, football or something like we like I I know that my husband, my dad growing up, like my family, they would never miss football on a Sunday. Like that was, you know, a staple. And if you can make reading a staple as well, because why not? Then everybody wins. It would be a great addition to your calendar, like you said, but you have to put it in intentionally. I think that we tend to to treat reading like it's for spillover time. Like, oh, if I have extra time, I'll read. Or it feels unproductive for some reason because we're so still or that we're just with ourselves. And it may be uncomfortable for some people. For me personally, if you ask me, I'm like, oh, I'm not much of a reader. I'm one of those people. But I will listen to an audiobook all day or a podcast. So do you have any preference or do you have any opinion on reading versus listening to books, which becomes more popular right now? Yes. And uh, you might hate me after this answer. I will not hate you, Nick. (laughs) I will not hate you. So about 80% of the inputs to our brain are visual. The other senses only make up about 20% of the inputs to our brain. So I think what happens with people that listen to the majority of books, and by the way, I listen to 25, 30 audiobooks, 25 or 30 audiobooks a year. So I think it's better than just listening to music or something like that. I listen to a lot of podcasts too. But if you understand that 80% of the inputs to your brain and the potential connections and relationships that you're developing, the neural pathway strength in your brain is based on a visual input, I think reading a physical book has a lot of additional benefits, including you can learn and retain information a lot faster. When you're reading a physical paper book too, it's kind of tangible. You feel it and you can't multitask. You can't be driving or doing the laundry or meal prepping while reading a physical paper book. And so reading that physical paper book, not only are you leveraging the visual input part of your brain, which is stronger, but you're also monotasking instead of multitasking. And when you're monotasking, of course, you're developing a stronger relationship to the information that you're consuming. And so, yeah, I think there are a lot of benefits to it. And plus that we live in a society of instant gratification where we are multitasking a lot and we're swiping all day long and focusing on low in, you know low energy activity when you read a physical paper book and you're monotasking you're developing the ability to focus you're developing what cal newport would call the ability to do deep work to perform deep work to be fully immersed and get into a flow state and that skill set's 
transferable to other areas of your life so you can work more efficiently as an example. So I, I love audiobooks, but I think that reading a physical paper book has a lot of additional benefits. Yeah, I had a feeling that would be your answer. I totally, I understand <laughs> the science of it. I have to get into the habit though, because I'm one of those yes. people who wants to multitask to feel like they're getting more done. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Have you ever heard that example of like, so I'll just give everybody the example. Sure. If you say the numbers one through 10 as fast as you can, you could say it pretty fast. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And if you count A through whatever the 10th letter is, F or something, or A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, H, I, whatever, you could say it pretty fast. But then if you task switch and you go A, 1, B, 2, C, 3, D, 4, E, 5, you're a lot slower. You're less efficient at performing multiple activities at the same time. So for me, it's one of the reasons why I say reading and note-taking are two totally separate activities, and we shouldn't task switch between them because then you have oh. to start your momentum all over again. So when I'm reading a book, if I find something that's related to my intention, I'll mark it off quickly. I'll highlight it, the page number in the area that I'm reading so I can go back to it, but I don't want to lose my reading momentum. And then at the end... I'll go back and I'll reread and reflect on that information and take notes. Again, it's a totally separate activity and you don't want to like bounce back and tweet you know, back and forth between these totally separate things. That's really interesting. So basically what you're saying is you're not pulling over on the road. <laughs> you're like, right. no, we're going to move forward and I'm going to remember that sign I saw and we're going to come back around to it at some point. What is your, what's kind of your tip for that then? Do you wait until you hit the end of a chapter or a transition period to go back or do you finish the whole thing and go through again? Like, do you go through books multiple times? Yeah, my process has changed a lot over time. So right now I'll read an entire book. Then I'll go back through to the things that I've highlighted that are related to my intention and I'll reread them. I'll re-listen to them, et cetera. Cause on Audible, you can kind of like set a mark in the book, which is nice. And then I'll, I think the implementation and the note-taking piece is totally separate. So then I'll focus on that. There's a great metaphor in Jim Quick's book, Limitless, where he says, imagine you are driving through a neighborhood and you're going really slow. Because you're going slow, you can multitask. You can pay attention to the houses you're driving by, the mailboxes, the cars in the driveway. You can notice details like, oh, that was cool. Look at a G-Wagon or something. But if you were speeding through that same neighborhood as fast as humanly possible, your eyes would have to be glued to the road because your brain can't multitask. You are focused. And the same thing happens with reading. It's counterintuitive, but if you read or listen to a book faster and take up more of your brain's, you know, like facilities, then you'll actually retain more of that information as well because you're not daydreaming and you're not thinking about multiple things at the same time. So I try to read faster. I try to listen faster while monotasking on just that activity. And you'll actually get more out of the book that way. That is super interesting because I would have thought that spending more time with it and letting it kind of sink in would be the answer to that. But and like speeding through it, you would gloss over it. But I also think about, you know, those those tests they give you where they just show like the first and last letter of the words and you can figure out what it says, even though it's all scrambled in between Mm -hmm. And I don't know the science behind it. Jim probably does, but the <laughs> but because he reads so quickly and he has all the those all the focus on on brain health and things like that. But when you're reading, in reality, you can read a lot faster than digesting every single word bit by bit to get the point, right? There must be some type of I've heard speed reading is a thing. You know, how much of that do you touch on in terms of speed of what you read and being able to actually increase reading speed as a benefit? I touch on it a little. It's not my favorite thing because I think it's a little bit advanced. You know, it's mm. not for somebody who's just starting their journey of personal development. And so that's why I don't talk about it in my book. I've played around with all sorts of recommendations and formats and techniques from other people like Jim. For instance, Jim says remove sub vocalization, which means read without actually reading it to yourself in your mind. You can read. It sounds so funny, but you can like just gloss over a page and you'll still retain just as much information as you would by sub vocalizing it to yourself. Now, I do think that repetition does lead to retention. So I'd be interested to push back on that. Jim's been on the on my podcast before, but it was kind of 
it was so early in my show that I didn't really push back on anything. But I think now if I have him on again, because he is putting out a new version of that book, Limitless, yeah. maybe I'll push back on it a little bit. I would love to hear that conversation for sure. So we've covered a few of the different actions that you can do to be a better and more action-oriented reader. What are some other tips you have in terms of, you know, like I said, I, you know, I come home with all these books, you know, is it where you put them? Is it, you know, like you said, putting it on the calendar, what are some of the ways we can set ourselves up for success to implement them successfully besides, you know, what happens once we've opened them? Yeah, great question. And in my book, I have a, a section called reading hygiene. And these are all little things that you can do to improve your success with each book. So most people end up reading personal development, business style material after the day is over, before they go to bed, when their willpower has already been depleted, they're tired, you know, they're trying to, you know, maybe they're falling asleep when they read a few pages. So they're reading when their energy is the lowest. I like to read when my energy is the highest. So I work out in the morning, get those exercise endorphins flowing. I come home. I have my first cup of coffee. I get that cognitive enhancer, that caffeine into my system. And then I read when my energy is at its highest. So I don't struggle with falling asleep while I'm reading a book because I don't do it when my energy is at its lowest. I, For me, it's such an important activity. I want to make sure that I do it when I'm in the right headspace. I've heard it said that, and this is a fun metaphor, even the best cup of coffee in the world will taste bitter if you're in a bitter mood. So why read after a full day of chaos and craziness? Read in the morning before your day has been disrupted. And that's an example of that reading hygiene section. Also talking about your body language. I mean, Vanessa Van Edwards, she's written a couple books on body language and subliminal emotions and stuff. And she says, if you read like this, kind of hunched down, closed off, looking down at this book, versus if you read while you're kind of opened up, it has an, it has an impact on your brain. And so for me, I try to read sitting straight up, you know, my arms kind of out, good posture, book in front of me, rather than kind of crouched down and closed off. And a whole bunch of stuff like that is in the book as well. That's really interesting. I wouldn't have thought of those types of details too, that that would actually make a difference, but it does. And like you said, it's about prioritization of it and optimizing it for the time that makes sense for you. I think it's the same excuses we hear about exercising, right? It's the, well, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. And then it's so hard to fit on the calendar because you've just packed your day with so many other things that you don't have the energy to support it at night. Like you said, it's five pages and you're zonked out. And that's always, I've always associated reading with winding down. And I think that's a really interesting perspective to bring it into the beginning of the day, much like a workout. It's really a brain workout at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, one of my biggest issues with the US public education system was that I was essentially taught to dislike reading when I was growing up. I mean, Same. I was forced to read things that I wasn't really interested in. And, and if I didn't perform well or have the same opinion as my teachers, I was penalized for that. So I was also taught that failure was a bad thing. And it's so backwards. I mean, as you know, in the world of business ownership, entrepreneurship, high performance, failure is amazing. And so is reading books. And I don't know why they have it so backwards. But yeah, I mean, that's another thing. Like we're taught not to love reading. We read when we wind down. We read to go to sleep. Everybody's like, when I read a page, I fall asleep instantly. But it's like, if you value it, insert it in the best part of your day and watch you like really start to fall in love with it. That's what happened to me, at least. So true. So true. And I'm so glad you brought that up because exactly the same in high school and middle school and all the reading took place as homework, which was at night. And that was mm -hmm. also the association. So I couldn't agree more with that. This is so great, though. How many tips that I've gotten? I may actually pick up a physical book. <laughs> pick up a physical copy of my book yeah. exactly pick up pick up a physical copy of uh rise of the reader where can people grab their copy just so we can make sure that that link is in the show notes and everyone knows where to find it i'll flip it to you it's available on all the major online retailers amazon Perfect. barnes and noble books a million and and listen for anybody that wants a custom book recommendation from me it's one of my favorite things to do for people so dm me at bookthinkers on Instagram. That's our biggest community. And tell me about a problem you have. 
tell me about a skill set you want to develop or something in between, and I'll give you a book recommendation and even follow up with you. Be your accountability partner a couple of months later to see if you've read it. So that's you know another time saying that offer just so that people feel like they can reach out and that I will respond. I love it. This is so appreciated, Nick. Guys, we'll have all that in the show notes for you to link up with Nick. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I appreciate the the thoughtful conversation. <music> 